working. Can you hear me now? There you go. What's that? Are we good? We're good. All right. You know, we don't have to hold the phones up anymore. We can get a video clip of that off our media now, by the way. So Pastor Alex looked like he was beginning to strain towards the end of the song. That phone's getting heavy, doesn't it? <laughs> Lots happened. Think of this. Last week we started out, the foyer was a different color. had a bunch of stuff in there. It's all gone. We swapped buildings around. So I want to give a big thanks to all those guys that came and helped out with the foyer, helped move buildings, uh, did all kinds of things. So things are beginning to really move. But besides all that, how many of you are ready for Christmas? Really? Okay. Does it need to snow so we get in the Christmas spirit? Yeah, yeah. yeah? okay. I don't know about that. I, that means I got to shovel the driveway out and of course Missouri it snows, it gets icy, right? So, maybe a little white snow. Maybe it'll happen tonight during the uh, Pirates plunder, but I doubt that too. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. I want to talk to you about something today because we are getting ready for Christmas. How, how many of you got have presents under a tree somewhere? Kids, you got presents under trees? No. What's, what's going on? Presents, no tree. Tree, no presents. I remember when I was a kid, I used to watch the, the tree, and every once in a while, there'd be a new present under the tree, and I'd go look, and I'd see if it was my present. And this may explain why you don't have presents under the tree, too, by the way, kids. So then I got really adapt to being able to lift that little corner of the present and see what it was. That was really good, to peek at the present. Of course, then I had the dilemma, I had to wait until Christmas to open the present, and that was a problem. So every time there's a new present, I'd lift that corner, and I'd be able to, to go in and see what was there, and then wait. And then something happened. It seemed like the presents started coming in boxes that didn't belong to the present. And then some presents were really small, but they were in a great big box. And there were some presents that were really heavy, but, well, they were really not that big. Seems like my mom and dad started getting kind of creative at some point in time. I began to wonder, hmm, what could that be? How could they get that creative? Why? Probably had something to do with my little sister. It probably didn't have anything to do with me. And I remember Christmases. Uh, Christmases were great in our family because we'd have, we used to have 60 to 100 people show up for Christmas. The entire family, that was once a year that the entire, entire family came together and my grandfather had a, a he ran the bus garage down in republic and he had this great big old garage that you could put two buses in that become the dining hall and the ladies were really good about covering everything up in sheets and made it look really nice and decorated it yeah, my grandfather didn't like it so much but you know what that day all the food would come pouring out and finally it was time and they'd have a prayer and you could hear in that garage the resounding amen as we prepared for a Christmas feast. I remember those days. I have great memories of those days. Uh, <coughs> Christmas gifts and gifts from the families and being around family. It was a great day. The world seems to be slipping a little bit, though. It doesn't seem the same today. Maybe it's because I'm older. Maybe it's because the world we live in. The world seems to have this same dilemma. It has lost Christmas's true meaning. And when you look around, we begin to realize we've lost the meaning. We're all wrapped up in presents and, and other things, but we've lost its meaning. And it's time to come together once again with family and friends. To do what is important. It's time to come together and remember the greatest gift of all, and that's Jesus Christ. Today we see less and less of Jesus. We sure don't see the nativity set up in the town hall anymore. We don't see those things. 
it's hard to find those things. You have to go to different places to see them. It's always in, in private. Have we lost sight of that glorious birth? Do you think? In Revelation chapter 5, I want to go over this with you. John sees the same thing. John has a, a problem here in Revelations. And I want to start off in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. It says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on, on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the world then he came and took the scroll out of the hand the right hand of him who sat on the throne why did John weep Why is this such a bad situation in heaven? What exactly did the lamb do to make himself worthy? And why does John look or hear a lion and see a lamb as though it was a slain? Why is the lamb worthy when nobody else is? And in the book of Revelations, why does the lamb look slain? Can you imagine being John and seeing this horrible sight? Nobody's worthy. John knew the effects of sin. Sin is dark. It's a dark veil that hinders us from seeing God. It's separated us from God. And as I, in Isaiah 59, verse 2, it says, But your iniquities have separated you from you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Paul tells us in Romans 3.23, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. And in Romans 6.23, it says that the wages of sin is death. Sin's horrible. It's a horrible thing. But in Romans 6.23, there comes but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen? Jesus Christ became the greatest gift of all. There is no gift under the tree that you can get that is any greater than Christ. And it wasn't just the birth that we need to focus on. Turn with me to John chapter 1. And while you're going to John chapter 1, in 1 Timothy 1.15 it says... This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. Christ as a gift to us came to lead us back into a relationship with the Father. He came to show us the Father. He came so that we would overcome that sin problem through him. And he was chosen to do all this because God's chosen people had failed. The Bible makes it clear Christ fulfilled all of this in his life. So the child was born. He had to be the one Nobody else could be found worthy. And we have to look at some of the things that Christ did in his life. God had a chosen people, right? The Jews. But there was one thing that the Jews were supposed to do. The Jews 
were supposed to draw all people to God. That was their mission. And they failed. God loved them even though they failed again and again. God still loved them. He still tried to do things with them. And he loved them so much when they were in Egypt. He, call, he calls them in Hosea, out of Egypt I call my son. He called him his, his son. They were part of his family. They were, they were his chosen people. We know that God never gave up on them. But they failed to show the world the Father. They failed to show the world the Father's glory. And of course then, the Word was made flesh. Mary was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Christ was born. If there's anything that we can't, if we may not get excited because the sun's shining and there's no snow, but if you've got to get excited about something, be excited because Jesus Christ came to this earth to save you and me. John tells us in John chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. As soon as Mary is with child, though, we begin to see Jesus fulfill the mission that the Jews were expected to fill. And he does it in such a way that sometimes we just kind of skim through the Bible and we, we overlook why Christ came, why he had to do the things he did. In Matthew 2, or in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, what's interesting, God sends Jesus to Egypt. <coughs> It says, when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And when I think about that, I think, okay, what happened? Wasn't the Jews there before? Didn't the Hebrews end up in Egypt at one point in time? They did, right? And it's kind of interesting because when you look at it, it was a man named Joseph that led him there because Joseph had a coat of many colors. He had a he had a dream, and while his brothers didn't like his dream, they didn't think they should kill him, so they sold him off as a slave. And ultimately, it led all the Hebrews into Egypt. But here we have another Joseph that has a dream, and it leads Jesus to Egypt. From his birth, he begins to fulfill the role of Israel. Now, here in Matthew, we begin to see a parallel. We have a man named Joseph that has a dream, and Gabriel tells him to take the child to Egypt. So we have both Josephs being led into Egypt. And then in Matthew 2, 15, it reads that he, and he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord, the prophet, saying, out of Egypt, I have called my son. You see what happens there? He fulfills the prophet from Hosea 1.11, or 11.1. He fulfills that from 11.1. He is literally quoting that, which is referring to the nation of Israel being called out of Egypt. Yet here the gospel writer picks up the text and declares it fulfilled in Jesus Christ, that child that was born. And it's not the only thing. As we begin to see Christ in his life, he begins to fulfill all kinds of different areas. For the first time, is, <clears throat> do you realize that the first time that Israel is used in the Bible, it refers to a spiritual name given to one man in Jacob. And you remember the story of Jacob in, in Genesis uh, 32, verse 28. And we start to run this story of Jacob, and Jacob has a wrestling match with the angel of the Lord, and he wants a blessing. Finally, his hip's dislocated, and he is no longer known as Jacob the deceiver, but he becomes known as Israel, one who is overcome with God and with man. He gets a new name, and it's, that new name had to do with a spiritual victory. So in the beginning of the New Testament, we begin to see that same name, Israel, being applied 
to one man, to Jesus Christ, the victorious one. There's some amazing parallels between the history of Israel and Jesus. You just sit and study these verses out. And as I run through them today, you're not going to be able to go back and forth, but take notes of them. In 1 Corinthians 10, 2, it says that we were, they were all baptized into Moses and into the cloud and the sea as the Hebrews left Egypt. They were baptized as Moses parted the sea and as they crossed that sea. And then God calls my son, or then, then Jesus is baptized in the Jordan, and he tells John, or John because it's to fulfill all righteousness. And then God, God calls him my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And after the Israelites were baptized in the Red Sea, they spent, how long did they spend out in the wilderness? Forty years. Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. And how long does he spend out in the wilderness? Forty days. See the parallel that begins to happen? And then as we roll on through this, we begin to realize at the end of Jesus' 40 days, he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy to combat Lucifer as he is being tempted. And he literally he quotes the book of Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy chapter 613, 616, and 83 from the very book that was given to the Hebrews at the end of their 40 years. Think of that. So in Psalms 80, verse 8, we read that God has brought a vine out of Egypt. A vine is a seed. It's lineage. All those little kiddos running around, those are our seed. They're running around. And they, they, I have a father that was, I'm part of his seed. God brings a vine out of Egypt. Jesus stands up in John 15, 1 and says, I am the true vine. We begin to see that child that was born. He was born with a great purpose. At his baptism, he declares himself as, uh, to be the fathers, which will accumulate to his death and resurrection. The voice of the heavenly saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Combined with Psalms 2, 7 and Isaiah 42 and the temptations in the wilderness, Satan even acknowledges that he is the son of God. And then he tries to persuade him to go to another path other than the cross. But it took the cross to save us. The woman in Samaria, the, our verse today in John 4, 25 and 26 she said to him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus says unto her, I that speak unto, I am he. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way you know. That was okay until Thomas. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. He came to show us the Father. He was born so that we could be reentered into that relationship with the Father. The Father becomes revealed through Jesus Christ. If you have known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? even on the cross at Calvary. Jesus fulfilled that gift. 
in John 19, verse 34, we begin to read what happens after. They broke the thieves' legs. Christ had already given up his ghost. He was already gone. And we begin to see this played out. And I want to show you something, because if you think Christ only came for three and a half years to show us the Father, no. Even today, he shows us the Father. <clears throat> In John 19, 34, it says, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with his spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Jesus completes a visual of this sanctuary that he is going to go do daily the priest's work for us. His intercession for us continues even today, and we need to realize what is literally happening. And as we look at today, we begin to realize that when they shoved that spear into his side, there was blood and water came out. And if you're going to color water in the big, deep blue, what? Sea, right? Hopefully you're not coloring a green sea. So water would be represented by blue, and blood, of course, is represented by what color? Red. Jesus does the work for us in the holy place, walks back and forth, but what's on the most holy place? It's God the Father. What separates those two? The veil. And the veil is what color? Purple. What two colors make up purple? Red and blue. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. You know, we come back to Revelation chapter 5. Even this day, Christ Jesus shows us the Father. His whole life, John sees that it was successful, that he fulfilled all righteousness. In Revelation 5, we see again in verse 1, And I saw on the right hand of him who had sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion, the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of our four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. That was his purpose, to be born, to live a life that we are not able to live, to overcome where we have failed, so that we can overcome through him. He made himself worthy. Verse 7, he says, and he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And you know what? That would be enough for us this day. But as we go to verse 8, it says, now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures... And the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are in the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, singing, You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain and have been redeemed. You have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests of our God, and we have reigned on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, the members of them, the numbers of them of ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Strength and honor and glory and blessing are worthy as the Lamb who is slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, strength, honor, and glory and blessing to every creature 
which is in heaven on the earth and under the earth, and such are in the sea, and all they that are in them. I heard a saying, blessed and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Our gift is simple. Christ was born. He was born to save us. He gave us the greatest gift of all. To fulfill all righteousness. To succeed everywhere that Israel fell to. So that we can have a spiritual victory through him. So that we can have access to the covenant made by God to Abraham and his seed. So that we'd be called sons and daughters of God. All these things are ours through faith in Jesus Christ, that child that was born. Each step of his life from birth to the resurrection was to fulfill all righteousness. So that we may have eternal life, abiding in his love forever and ever. All these things are ours through Jesus Christ. You know, presents, trees, snow, no snow, lights, those things are all great. But if you're going to share anything this season, share Jesus with your family and your friends. You know, I remember lifting that corner, that wrapping paper, looking at the gifts under the tree. The excitement of seeing what I was about to receive. The disappointment of having to wait to open that gift. We don't have to wait. We don't have to wait for our gift from Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. And he will sup with me. I will sup with him. And he will with me. Even today, Christ continues to show us the glory of the Father. That's why we're here. It is through Jesus that we can see clearly. And it's through Jesus that we overcome our sin. And he tells us all these things in Revelations. Revelations 12, 10, it says, And I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of the Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them, day, accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved their lives not unto death. Revelations 21, 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God. And he will be my son. Christ sets today to call us into a relationship to be part of the family. We aren't separate. We need to be united. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Verse 13 tells us, Every creature which is in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and under the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessed and honor, and glory, and power be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, forever and ever. Amen. That birth, was our greatest gift. That life that he lived is our path to the Father. Share Jesus this, uh, this holiday season.